All right, Sam, I'm going to read this. And I think according to this, I'm going to fold. OK. Good move. I agree there, fold. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the Two Fish at the Table Poker Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Legend Ben on Poker Stars. I'm your other host, East Coast Sam. As we mentioned last time, here we are with our latest installment of poker documentaries. We have three ones that are probably not very well known, The Online Phenomenon, Poker Kings, and Real Poker. Yeah, and uh, again, these are all uh, poker documentaries or specials that you can find free of charge on YouTube. Uh, they've been up there for a while, so you're feel free to watch along and uh compare your thoughts and opinions to what our thoughts are on these three again we've covered quite a few documentaries by this point we've seen you know kind of tv specials host narrated like like narrative narrative um documentaries what kind of historical approaches to poker covering you know a part of the world you know year to year and stuff so again we have a, we, have, we have another kind of variety pack of uh ways to actually create a documentary about poker and uh, the first one that we will be discussing here is called The Online Phenomenon, a very short 29 minute documentary made in around 2014 uh, that kind of is, it's one of the weirder videos to kind of refer to as a documentary, which may be a little bit of a loose uh, use of that terminology. And it really is kind of two halves to it. One is a series of interviews of four poker players, Max Sanders, Tom Lum, Omari Thomas, and Ollie Quinn. And the back half of the of the video really is just sort of hand breakdowns, comparing four pros to four amateurs, analyzing a, a hand table sort of printout of a situation with a hand given certain action. Yeah, I mean, these four guys aren't super well known pros. I don't even know if they're still in the game or not. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, the first half is just sort of a bunch of clips from various interviews. They talk about how they got into the game. They talk about what they do as online professionals, uh, you know, a little bit about how you slowly recognize players over time. You don't really know at first uh, who's the best player, but then you learn by playing so often who the best players are. And also fancy play syndrome, which is when you make a fancy move, essentially just to make a fancy move. Uh, you know, sort of things like that, that I think are pretty common in a lot of poker videos. And, you know, anybody who's listening to this podcast and has, you know, is a, even a semi-professional or an experienced amateur would be familiar with a lot of this stuff already. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the fancy play syndrome. I kind of liked it being, you know, named that that sort of trend that's given sort of a terminology there, because uh, it's definitely something that uh, I don't really ever do when I play poker. I'm, I'm I kind of stay more than the lines, maybe than some people might on that rare occasions. But obviously, if you want to be a balanced player, then you know you can refer to a you know a wacky play as trying to balance your range. But yeah, but yeah, then you have a fancy play syndrome. Uh, mm -hmm. it's definitely, kind of um, you know, it was really probably the one uh, sound bit that I really you know my attention was maybe drawn slightly more than the rest of this relatively low key, low quality uh, uh, film or video or whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the sound quality in this whole thing is pretty atrocious. Like it doesn't feel like they have really much of a special camera. It just kind of felt like this guy wanted to do a, a video about poker, had a couple of camcorders, recorded a few people and put it together on YouTube. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that's, that's, a, that's you know, the worst thing in the world. I mean, this is a very low key podcast, for example. But again, compared to some of the more composed, professionally done documentaries we've covered, this is definitely on the lower side of things so that's in that uh, category. Yeah, I don't want to sound snobby or anything, but yeah, this is more of a video than a documentary per se. I mean, it's a nice guide in terms of what online poker was like in the mid 2010s. I you know, wouldn't know how super, it's probably relevant enough now if you're an online professional, mm. but it's, it's nothing super special. It's nothing that uh, I found really, really interesting the first half. The second half where it transitions to the professionals breaking down the hands versus the amateurs was a little interesting. It was kind of interesting to see yeah. uh, how consistent all the professionals were and then the amateurs not really thinking about it. <laughs> really like, all right, five, six suited. Uh, yeah, I'll call. Sure, why not? Uh, you know, I have top pair and a guy's three bit into me. Yeah, I'll call. It's top pair. Uh, you know, amateurs definitely play for the moment. You know, what's the best situation now instead of really breaking it down, uh, you know, the previous action and the action to come. So, I, I mean, I do appreciate that part. I thought that was, you know, a bit of an interesting part, though, not super well paced. So, 
Yeah, you know, it's funny because hand breakdowns are one of the more common poker videos on YouTube, on the internet, whether it's Dan Agrano breaking down a hand that he played or Doug Polk doing his, you know, his content. And uh, the this is definitely a unique spin on the hand breakdown because this is more than, first of all, it's more than one player breaking down a hand uh, uh, for, you know, we have eight players basically uh, providing their thoughts on the hand. And so there's kind of that, small amount of comedy to like seeing the contrast between the pros and Joes um, uh, and making their, their decisions there. And I was of course playing along too. I sort of, I, I paused the video, looked at, cause they, it's a printout of the table. So you see what your cards are. If it's, it's some of the hands situations are, are off to the flop, some are pre-flop. And I was pretty proud of myself that I actually was in full agreement with the pros for all four hands. Uh, just to give an example here, the first hand is this ace deuce hand where the, the flop was ace, like king 10 or something like that, or, you know, and uh, there was uh, multiple players in the hand uh, post flop. And so uh, all four pros say to fold the ace deuce, you're, you know, you're only ahead a very small fraction of the time and you're barely a favorite when you are ahead against multiple players. And the amateurs in this case have a variety pick of fold, call or raise. Uh, in that spot. So that was you know, a good start to the four hands to give us a good variety pick of just the sheer contrast between the pro and the amateur analyzing a hand. And the other, the other hands I'll do, you know, I'll do, the, do the same idea here. And um, uh, the amateur is just like, you know, calling king queen on the button of 11 big blinds. It's just, it, 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 I mean, it, it's not done at the expense of the amateur. It's not, there's not the editing facilities there to really uh, lay into them, but it's just meant to show like how you know, how just in these, these small little micro poker moments, how uh, just having a little bit of experience will uh, relate to a different uh, choice in a, in, a, in a hand spot like that. Yeah, I mean, that was this this section was the section that I really liked. I mean, everything before was just kind of a bunch of clips. Mm -hmm. I do kind of like how there's, you know, sort of shots of them playing poker live at tables with these oversized cards and all that. I thought that was a little cute. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, for the most part, this is, you know, a super substantial video. If, you're familiar with the content we've reviewed in this podcast. You've already seen a lot of what's in the online phenomenon. But if you're not familiar that much with the game, I think that this this might be a nice video to watch. I, you know, I mean, it, again, it's pretty low key. It's relatively yeah. short. We, you know, I watched at two x speed as I always do, so it only took me about 15 minutes to watch this thing. And again, I, I the first half it's definitely skippable uh, for anyone like us who've seen, you know, upwards of 20 documentaries by this point, but you know, for, uh, it's a weird watch, but I'm kind of happy I saw it because it was definitely a unique uh, hand breakdown style for, for this video overall. Absolutely. Yeah. And this moves us to, uh, the 2003, um, film TV special, something, uh, 45 minutes long. So it's into one hour block on TV called poker Kings. Uh, this covers five players over about a one-year span from 2002 into the summer of 2003, uh, kind of month by month, kind of not. I mean, obviously, if you're covering multiple people, you're not going to have, you know, neat and tidy events in each person's life at, at the one-month marks. But, you know, kind of cover, breaking down like, the countdown of, until the next main event. And uh, the five players there, Phil Helmuth, Carlos Citrone, Robert Barconi, Simon Trumper, and Gary Bush. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, pack of celebrities to have here. I mean, you have Phil Hellmuth, who, of course, I mean, just so many great moments from Phil Hellmuth just all throughout this documentary. I mean, he brings he brings the goods. And keep in mind, this was shot just before the 03 main event. This is shot between the 02 main event and the 03 main event. So he's not a big celebrity at this point, so to speak, in the game. And he, he just, just acts exactly sort of, like this. Yeah. It just goes to show that it's just Phil is just so pure. And then, uh, yeah, Robert Varconi, who had won the previous year, and has a very interesting story throughout the movie in that he's a main, you know, he's a main event champion, he's won $2 million, he's starting a family, but he also doesn't want to pursue poker professionally. He kind of just wants to, you know, you know, let's let the gravy train roll a little bit, but I want a job elsewhere. And then the other three players, you know, kind of, you know, they're, they're sort of interchangeable with each other in my mind. I mean, each yeah. of them has little interesting character beats but for the most part they're all these you know they're you know Simon Trumper I've heard about before Gary Bush and Carlo not as much mm -hmm. um but you know they're sort of tournament circuit grinders who can definitely turn a profit but aren't quite super profitable and they have to keep you know traveling around the world so to speak and they're good friends with each other so they have a rapport with each other 
So, you know, there's, there's definitely some intriguing bits and pieces in this documentary, but just doesn't quite get there for me overall. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. I, I actually kind of like this one a bit more than you, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I like the contrast between all five players during the kind of poker off season. And, you know, the poker is never in the off season per se. The world is a poker, you could say, would be in the off season. Um, but, I, you know, I liked the, the beat of Arconi going to job interviews, talking about why he thinks poker is hurting him. Uh, in these interviews when he's trying to spin it into a positive, you know, because uh, so, I mean, you know, the, the personal, the personal skills the communication skills of poker, yes, are, are, you know, relevant in the workplace, I suppose, but really, um, I mean, I, I'm kind of surprised because it's, it's not like he had a, a reputation as a, like a poker player for a while and then stopped after one of the main events. It, right. he, it was never his main thing. So I'm a little surprised by, I guess, the short sightedness of some of the employers. I mean, we don't really get a camera in too many of these interviews maybe one interview we actually see a you know a few seconds of but uh i guess there's just a whole kind of like human psychology of what uh what what qualifies as sort of a negative in a person's past when you're considering an applicant for a job interview i've never interviewed them for a job so i can't speak to what the you know human resources and stuff are but it, it's a, it's not really touched upon but it's something that definitely got me thinking about it for sure after i'd watched this uh, this episode yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rob's an interesting person in that he was, you know, sort of the first amateur to win the main event, so to speak. I mean, obviously, people who were less experienced in the past had won, but he was the first one that had a spotlight on him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, nobody really, you know, I'm not trying to be mean to the guy, but nobody really felt like he deserved it. He was sort of the first person to have that baggage attached to him. Mm -hmm. uh, but he comes off as totally fine. I mean, again, he's not, you know, blowing his $2 million on booze or anything. He's He definitely seems like a good family guy. We see him with his kid and with his wife. Uh, and he comes off as humble. He comes off as somebody who's not bragging about how good he is or bragging about how famous he is, uh, unlike Phil Helmuth, but you know, nice. You know, Helmuth, the, the, the main uh, focus on his sort of fifth of this uh, documentary is his writing of his first poker book. Right. Uh, and then also, you know, we see him, he, he plays in, he plays in the main events and does very well. He, he cashes in different events. So he, you know, again, his, his story is more also about how he can focus on his family, much like Robert can, because he has the, the money and the flexibility in his schedule to really control what he wants to do day to day, which is, which is good for him. And, you know, Thomas has gone, you know, been people tell you all the time about Helmut is a great family, great, great guy, great family, family man, great husband, great father. So, uh, we, we'd see a little bit more than we probably had, had seen in prior like main event interview coverage of that. So that was nice to see too. It was a great uh, car interview of him talking about picking up his kids and how uh, as a parent, uh, if you're the one to pick them up that are a bit more open about how their day was versus if it's after they get home to the house. I thought that was kind of kind of a nice moment too, because I'm not a parent, but I, I could I could kind of see myself as a kid. Oh yeah, maybe I was kind of like that as a kid too. So it felt very real too. Absolutely. Yeah. When that quote happened, I was just like, yeah, that's so true. An hour after I would come home from school, you know, my parents would be like, how's, how was school, Sam? Just good. <laughs> just, I'm, just, I'm so tired. I've moved on with my day. And so again, I, I, I did enjoy the Helmuth and Barconi stuff. And, you know, you mentioned how the other three guys were a little interchangeable. Uh, I guess as personalities, I would agree with them. What actually happens to them in this special, I would say is not interchangeable because each one does something distinct from the other as far as what tournaments they're playing. I mean, Bush and Carlo do play together in Austria and Russia and they do, you know, okay, apparently just, they mentioned how the, the winnings has to overcome the cost of the trip and also the buy-in. So they kind of break even plus maybe a little bit, but you know, that's pretty realistic. Um, but, you know, Gary, he misses his baby's birth all while his fiance is trying to get a marriage visa. And then when uh, his, when they do get married, the baby has to be in, the fiance's home country until everything is sort of checked, checked off and stuff. So that was something that was specific for Gary, for example. And, um, you know, we see some employee in one of the infamous heart monitor poker games, which I'm surprised I have not been able to find somewhere online. I would have, I would love to see uh, just a, any iteration of a tournament that had the heart monitor uh, in a That'd be kind of cool to watch too. That would be fun. Yeah. And then I guess the, um, we, we do have a light touching on how some, you know, relationships can be tested from the strains of playing poker and being, you know, the balance of family life or girlfriend life or, 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 you know, marriage life 
with poker. That's briefly touched upon, although it's not really, uh, a, you know, a, a super, you know, focused uh, topic. And, uh, you know, the, this special does culminate with the last about 10 minutes covering that main event of that year. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the problems I have with this documentary is that it kind of, you know, the emphasis is on how are they going to do at the O3 main event all throughout the coverage, and then it just feels like an afterthought, the main event at the end. Um, yeah, I mean, this, the storylines of the other three guys are, are totally fine, and, you know, there's little beats about their personalities and all that, but I really think it would have been nice if there had been another 15 minutes to really let each of those three guys settle, give a little bit more substance and bones to their, you know, their arcs, so to speak rather than just, you know, rush through it all. Uh, you know, it did feel like all five guys got roughly equal focus. But I mean, when you have somebody as flashy as Phil Helmuth, you know, he's going to take away so much of the attention. You need to you need to even the playing field a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, the main event, you know, obviously Phil gets 27th that year, uh, which, you know, he makes $45,000. He gets to the final three tables and he looks crestfallen <laughs> when he gets there, uh, which is pretty funny. But yeah, the other four guys, I mean, Carlo gets 159th place, you know, which is respectable enough, I suppose. Yeah, but, you know, they don't really do anything else. Well, I, I did kind of like how we actually learned what place the the first three bust outs were in like, like these random, like day one center and 15th place. Cause we don't normally see that. Like, I mean, in the main event video game, oddly enough, we saw that for like day one and two, but in the, in the, all the modern broadcasts of the main event and even the classic broadcasts of the main event, we don't actually know a place a player gets knocked out up until the money bubble. So it's yeah. just kind of interesting how they, so they actually were keeping track back then of each individual knockout from the starting field of 800 plus. So that was, um it's kind of kind of a fun little small thing, detail to have in there uh obviously we do remember that Farconi busted with kings into aces on day one in that uh oh three broadcast uh when he was, when he shared a table with Bill Brunson so you know that kind of was a kind of good like circle filling in there to uh connect those dots there uh but ironically Gary doesn't even play the main event of the of our five guys he sits it out because of the of the money reasons, you know, 10 K is a lot of money to pony up. So I can, I respect him for not pushing his bankroll beyond where he's comfortable of, but then I kind of question what was the point of covering him if he wasn't going to be playing in the main events in the first place, unless they just picked five, five guys and just were committed to them no matter what. Uh, I mean, maybe if Gary had won some more money earlier that year, he would have put the main event or maybe he never was going to, but uh, it was kind of an odd choice. If you put the whole picture together here, why they would pick him then. Yeah, and as you know, I mean, it's not just the main event. There's other WSOP events. There's side action. There's just being in Las Vegas. You know, what, what was their experience like, generally speaking? Did they do anything else that would have been interesting to see? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I will say I enjoyed that everyone kind of had our storyline of sorts. Some, there was yeah. you know, something substantial during that year to cover on, or even if it wasn't, you know, tangible events in their life. It was still some interviews or some time of helping with his family and stuff. That was very cool. It felt very, very human, not fake, like underground poker did for example and uh it does end the, the the whole thing does end of a true epilogue where we kind of briefly cover all five guys and carlo ends up in prison and yeah, ends up bringing up with, with his partner so you know it's kind of a downbeat sort of um ending for those two and so again with the epilogues uh, these are so often just like you know a static image of them plus like a little bit of text of what happened to them so that's kind of a shame that we you know obviously if they funded the public would have shown it but uh you know, I often like epilogues just because it, I'm just curious what happens after the, you know, the camera stopped rolling. And so, and I, I was caught off guard by, by the imprisonment, obviously, the breakup I kind of would have, would have guessed, but that was definitely, uh, you know, it was, it was an okay, you know, coda to the whole action here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't hate this documentary. It's just, it's not super substantial. So there's not really a whole lot to... No, it's about. not substantial, but it's kind of my like sleeper favorite of all the ones we've covered. Like the other ones that were that were very that were very good that we ranked, that I ranked very high on my hierarchy. This is kind of like a sleeper favorite of mine. Not okay. quite a guilty pleasure favorite of mine, but like a sleeper favorite. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And uh, that moves us to the longest of the three of these documentaries. This one is called Real Poker. 59 minutes long. Uh, no one's really sure in the comments on YouTube what year it was made. Uh, it is uh, a very bizarre video. You're already laughing. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you ex ex explain what you're. I think. I think I can summarize this whole uh, video. I don't know what to call it. Movie thing uh -huh. with uh, a line of text that actually appears on screen in the "Where Are They Now?" montage at the end of this documentary. Okay. Chris Moneymakers 
apostrophe S is still a spokesman, spokesman spelled with three S's <laughs> for a major online poker capital P site capital S. That is an actual line in this documentary. Um, yeah, I mean, we were talking earlier about how uh, online phenomenon shouldn't necessarily count as a documentary. This should not count as a documentary <laughs> either. This is, it's more like, it's just clips of different poker players, none of whom I've ever heard of beside Phil Gordon and Chris Moneymaker, just talking about their life in, in poker. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. Well, so um, it, it's like, there's kind of like stop points in there's like six or seven topic division sections where Ivan Katz, the host slash creator of this film will say, and now let's hear about their thoughts on female poker players or the international scene or superstitions. And there's actually timestamps in the video's description of each of those uh, sections. So there's about seven or eight sections to this movie, but they all function the same way in that these 10 interviewed players are, you know, talking about different topics and, um, you know, oftentimes it's like maybe a very brief sound bit because it, only for that small period of time were they discussing the relevant topic at the time. And again, yes, you're right. It's eight random people, a couple of ladies to be fair, and then Phil Gordon and Moneymaker. Uh, Moneymaker, I like his hair up in this video. I must, you know, it looks pretty good actually. I kind of like him a little similar to mine actually. And uh, he, again, they just kind of ramble on and on and on about these topics. And again, most of these are sound bits and ideas that we've heard about in other documentaries. So there's nothing really unique to any of the, any of the topics discussed or to other particular comments for it. So uh, this made for a very, I was really losing my, my, my focus while watching this video. Yeah, and that this is the most low budget documentary I've ever seen. Everything was clearly shot on one camera <laughs> using the built in microphone for the camera. Um, as you know, there's typos all throughout the text. It's not just in the end montage at the end. There's multiple spaces in between words. There's no commas to separate things. The camera angles are just very strange. You know, sometimes it's a traditional, you know, like this setup that I have right now where someone's in a room and they're talking to a camera. Other times it's outside. There's one guy who was interviewed in his car. The lighting looks really bad. The sound quality is really bad because again, it's a built-in microphone. At one point, the wind starts blowing across the microphone and you can't hear anything. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't want to be mean to this guy, Ivan Katz, but yeah, I mean, he just, he clearly just picked up his video camera and just started filming people. Uh, and it's just, it, it just looks really bad. It looks yeah. like it's from the 1990s. It's terrible. I was trying to piece apart when he made this because Moneymaker does reference to Joe Hashem and Greg Raymer at, at one point. So it has to have been after uh, Hashem's 05 win. So maybe 05, 06, when Phil Gordon was still kind of somewhat relevant at the time, I, I guess. I don't know. Um, but uh, so I was trying to uh, make notes, uh, as I always do for this documentary. And I did, I had a section for each component of the, of this, of this documentary so like each uh time stamped section and for over half of the sections i literally wrote nothing because i was there's nothing that that stood out to me there were really maybe maybe uh two comments that like got my attention from like one out of ten to like three out of ten and the first one was of um this guy i forget his name talking about how he's kind of normally an anti-social guy and how yeah. when he's at the table, he can kind of like almost role play, he can kind of be whoever he wants to be. And it kind of, it changes the mental equation of who he can be in public. So I, you know, as someone who's been kind of in a social too, I could kind of relate to that a little bit and it makes sense. And yeah, I've, you could be very charismatic and talkative and having a good time at the table or kind of being composed tight to yourself, being quiet, playing tight. So that, you know, rang a little little true of me, of, of my sort of, you know, personality wise. And, and then the other uh, takeaway I really had was just kind of the almost misogynistic comments that some of the interviewers had about women at the table. Um, not necessarily a good thing that they're doing this, but it, at least I was like, huh, they're, they're sitting on, on, in public on camera. Okay, good for them, I guess. That, those were really the only two moments where I was like mildly caught my attention. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, this is just the whole, the whole vibe of, I mean, again, this was filmed sometime during the poker boom or in the 80s, I have no idea based on the film quality. Um, you know, it's just sort of the pinnacle of, you know, anybody can become a professional poker player. You know, here again, all these 
you know, amateur, low experience, people are like, oh yeah, I made like $40,000 at the poker table, you know, look at me on hot stuff, you know, and I, you know, I bet you that none of these people are in the game anymore. I mean, Phil Gordon, who was a top professional is no longer a professional poker player. So, I mean, that just gives you a sense of like, I bet none of these people are playing poker anymore. I mean, I mm -hmm. could not imagine any of them making a living out of this. That's, I mean, that's really it. That's the only real takeaway I have, but this is just the pinnacle of, you know, anybody can come in and play the game. You know, this is at a time when poker was a big deal and, you know, you can just imagine Black Friday just coming in, just wiping these people out. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, if you were to, to read the list of topics in this documentary on like the times it's on the YouTube description, you could probably you could probably guess in your head exactly what everyone would say for each of those topics. Oh, these international players are very aggressive, they're very crazy. Oh, woman, you can pull up they're, they're not as aggressive enough. Oh, I'm, I might wear the same jacket if I win a hand and then I'll win next hand and I'll win. Oh, I'll win a jacket forever now. You know, just kind of the cliche poker sound bits that we've seen a million times that. You don't need to watch this. You know, again, the sound mixing is just atrocious. It it, it almost made me forget about the uh, sound and the poker phenomenon, um, online phenomenon, because of how bad the sound mixing was. And I, I might rank this as the worst documentary of all the ones we've covered uh, on this on, on our podcast here. I mean, obviously, the, the search for the American dream was pretty bad, but that at least amused me of how bad it was. This one just just I almost fell asleep watching it. So. Uh, I mean, frankly, after about 15 minutes of this, and keep in mind this is at 2x speed, I kind of just looked at the, you know, you know how like when you um, put your cursor over the YouTube time thing, it kind of shows a little preview. I kind of just skimmed through it, saw that it was just all footage, and I just left this on in the background while I did other things. <laughs> I just stopped taking notes after 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I mean, this was just, this is the worst thing I think we've reviewed on the podcast. I mean, Tilt is so bad, it's good. Search for the American Dream is like my most hated documentary because it had potential and it just couldn't follow through on it. This one just has no potential in it. I don't understand why it was made. I don't understand what the purpose of it is. I don't think it's worthwhile at any point. Just didn't seem like the guy cared. No I offense. Think care. I, think, I think he didn't care. I thought I think I think because he, he appears on camera at the very start of the film. Oh, hey, I'm, I'm Ivan Katz and this is you know, real poker and, you know, and I don't know. I feel like he cared, but I, I don't think he had the resources and the motivation to put it all together in a better way. If you didn't have the resources or motivation, then you just shouldn't have made it in the first place. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I mean, again, you know. this was probably made a good almost decade before it was even put on YouTube. So you have to wonder what he did with it after he made it. I have no idea. And it was kind of funny. Probably, I, I laughed actually at the credits because it just went created by Ivan Katz, directed by Ivan Katz, signed by Ivan Katz. Like just it was just all his name in the credits. There's a one man. Um, you know, show basically, and then obviously he had his interviewed players' names in the credits too. But really, I mean, it, I give him props for actually getting moneymaker. I mean, we did get Raymer actually, so who knows? It, might, it probably is easier than it looks to get these players on on camera for something, but uh, it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just the where are they now montage is the worst. Where are they now montage? It's all just he still plays poker, she still plays poker. That's <laughs> that's all there is. Yeah, it's just just really, really bad. This was really, really bad. This is like one of the worst documentaries I've ever seen, honestly. I don't think it counts as a documentary. I would not count, let this count as a No, I mean, these three are maybe a little bit stretching the definition of poker documentary, but uh, I, I mean, I, I'm sure poker thing is maybe airing like the travel channel or something kind of like that yeah. for like an hour special, but nonetheless, on, under our loose banner, uh, it does count. And uh, these, and again, real poker, very weak, Poker Kings, I can kind of recommend. It was kind of a novelty little, you know, little thing. And then Online Phenomenon, maybe watch the back half if you want to laugh at some bad hand analysis. But uh, that's about it. Yeah, that's it. So I think that, is, that, that concludes this episode of the podcast. We've had two episodes in one week because I had a miscommunication between me and Sam. We were, he thought we were going to do both the video game review and the uh, these uh, documentary in one episode, but uh, I hadn't watched them yet, so... Uh, we give you, you get just two episodes in one week. I hope you enjoyed both of them. Uh, our next topic still to be determined. If you guys have a suggestion for our next content, let us know. It could be a continuation of a program we've covered before. It could be something brand new, some movie and movies. Really, let us know. We're, I'm, as always, we're always trying to find new interviewees to uh, talk to. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, again, anybody who has any experience in poker, you don't have to play the main event. We've obviously interviewed Ernest Wiggins. If you were in a viral hand, we'd love to hear from you. If you're a uh, 
uh, an MSO person, we'd love to hear from you. Whoever wants to be on, we're happy to have you on. And we will ask you questions and give you time to speak about things at length, unlike uh, you know some of the documentaries we've reviewed, <laughs> uh, so that you'll actually have something interesting to say. Yes, yeah, so, and, and again, some of, some of the best moments on this podcast for me are always some of those great, insightful moments with our with our guests. And so uh, we want to continue that as we get very, very close to the the first events of the 2023 main event. It's coming up. It's coming up, and we're looking forward to being a part of it when we go to Vegas this summer to really immerse ourselves even deeper than I did two years ago for the first time. Absolutely. So, guys, until next time, enjoy your poker, enjoy your TV, enjoy your poker on TV. Take care.